Continuing our coverage on the Radeon 7900 XTX range of AIB cards sees today with us looking at the big boy, the Chungus, the Sapphire 7900 XTX Nitro Plus Vapor X card. And boy, is it a big one. And an absolutely gorgeous card too. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Hello mate, you all right? Yeah, just got all the bits from my banging new gaming PC. Just got to put it together. It's going to be so much better than yours. Oh, right. What did you get then? The latest Intel 12th gen processor, a feature packed motherboard and 32 gig of DDR4 memory. See, miles ahead of yours. <laughs> you, you realize that board needs DDR5 memory, don't you? Don't tell me you went and bought the wrong stuff. DDR4 is so 2014. I can't believe you was that stupid. <gasps> what? No, you're joking. What should I get then? For me, I'd be looking at Corsair's newest Vengeance DDR5 kits, or if you're wanting that all important RGB, then go for the Dominator Platinum RGB. Oh, you are a lifesaver, thanks. But where can I find out more? By clicking the link in the description below, of course. <laughs> you call me the stupid one. So let's address the elephant in the room, and it's a gorgeous elephant for that matter. This, I'll be honest, is the one I was waiting for, the Nitro Plus from Sapphire. For some reason, as soon as you think about AMD GPUs, a couple of brands come to mind, and Sapphire is generally at the top of that stack. So let's start with the design. It's a huge step up from the previous generation, but still incorporates some of the same characteristics that made the Nitro Plus range of cards famous in the first place. If anything though, Sapphire have moved away from some of the gamery aesthetics while making the card look more premium at the same time, and it works. It's large, though not the longest 7900 XTX we've had in at 320 millimeters long, but it is very tall at 135 millimeters high, including the PCI Express slot. And it's also fairly kind of thick at 71 millimeters, which makes it three and a half slots thick, hence me calling it the Chungus. It's also the heaviest 7900 XTX I've had in my hands at 2,220 grams, which is 85 grams more than the XFX model we looked at recently and 155 grams more than the reference AMD card. But just from kind of an initial look, that weight is evenly distributed across the whole card and adds to the kind of full stability of the card. Now, for those in fear of GPU sags, Sapphire have included a bracket that mounts to the expansion slots on your case to help prop the card up. The main shroud of the card has taken the word simplicity and cranked it up to 11 with a curved gunmetal design that wraps around each end of the card with the triple dual bearing fans with the same angled fan blades that were featured on the 6950 XT Nitro Plus. Though thankfully they've actually dulled down the RGB on the fans by completely ditching it as I wasn't a massive advocate on it with the last generation. Instead, Sapphire has added two light bars onto the side of the GPU, meaning that it illuminates both the motherboard and the side of your case if used horizontally, while in vertical mounting, it would glow on the vertical GPU mount along with blasting up inside your case. Now, without the RGB, the card almost looks kind of something similar to what Apple would make with its clean, simplistic design. Though as a fan of all things RGB, I'm liking what's been done here, as it's a massive step up from Sapphire cards of old. One cool feature with the fans is that Sapphire allow you to remove these fans and replace them if they ever cause you any issues. Now at the top of the card, along with the large RGB strip, also has the first view of what the cooler is actually made up of, including a molded internal front plate, which makes up a support bar that merges into part of the cooling shroud and gives extra stability to the PCB, along with acting as a heatsink for the VRMs and memory that we will take a look at very shortly. It's also along the top where you'll find a BIOS switch, which allows you to choose between the OC BIOS the secondary BIOS, or to use the Sapphire Trick software to be able to switch the BIOS on the fly. The OC BIOS is geared for a whopping 420 watts, which is the most we've seen on any 7900 XTX so far. And this is why we see some pretty hefty clock speeds of 2510 MHz on the game clock and 2680 MHz on the boost clock, which is actually identical to the XFX Merc 310 that we looked at recently, though that had much less total board power. To achieve the power delivery in a stable way, the card comes with three 8-pin PCI Express connectors, none of that 12VH PWR nonsense here, and Sapphire have also upped their backplate game with an all-aluminium backplate that is added for support as well as acting as a heatsink to help dissipate heat as well. It's not as maybe clean looking as the front of the card with various perforation holes, though I'm sure it's actually for a reason, along with a small area where the backplate ends and meets with the shroud of the card to help air pass through. There's also the smallest amount of RGB here with the Sapphire logo that lights up, 
and also down this end is where we will find space for an ARGB pass-through connector, of which a cable does come included, to sync the rest of your system with the card, as well as a fan connector, which is kind of mislabeled, but is still a nice feature to have nonetheless. I say mislabeled because it says fan in, technically is fan out. On the rear I.O. things get changed up a bit from what we've seen on other cards as it does have two HDMI ports and two display ports, which is a little bit different considering a reference card comes with a Type-C port instead. Taking the card apart was pretty simple with a backplate holding the bulk of the cooler together, along with four hex screws on the cooler shroud which then allows you to take the shroud off, being sure to remove the two connectors for the fans and RGB strips. You also have to take the I.O. apart to allow access to that side of the card and then with a bit of light pressure, things come apart quite easily. The PCB is pretty plentiful, reminding me of the XFX model we looked at recently, though with a lot more circuitry in the bottom right, likely because of the RGB and fan connectors. Like other 7900 XTX cards we've looked at, we find the same 20 phase setup consisting of 17 for the GPU and then 3 for the memory of which all of the components are made by monolithic power systems. The GPU phases are managed by the MP2857 controller, while the memory is managed by the MP2856 controller. All of the phases for the GPU and the memory are again made by MPS, and are all the MP87997 power stages, which are rated for 70 amps of current each. To keep things under control, the card has a very large heatsink which is split into two large thin stacks with seven heat pipes connecting them, as well as a vapour chamber base plate which makes direct contact with both the GPU core and GDDR6 memory, while the front plate makes contact with the VRM phases to help dissipate heat away from the main part of the card. Overall, it's a pretty extensive cooler and is on the larger side of what we've seen and has clearly had a lot of thought and design put into it, so I'm expecting some pretty great performance in terms of the cooling side of things, while also remaining on the quiet side at the same time. So let's see how it stacks up in terms of performance against other cards. Starting with Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, we can see the Sapphire card coming out on top with a lead of 7% over the AMD reference card, while also sitting slightly ahead of the other AIB cards as well in both the averages and the 1% lows. In Cyberpunk, the Nitro Plus also pushes ahead of the reference card as expected with 6% extra performance and now also overtakes the Nvidia RTX 4080 with slightly stronger 1% lows, though the average comes in the same at 69 FPS. Giggity. In Death Stranding, the Sapphire card continues to lead the pack of 7900 XTX cards with a 4% uplift in performance over the AMD reference card, along with pushing ahead of all other AIB cards by at least 2%. It also demonstrates better 1% low scores as well, pushing it beyond the RTX 4090 in the dips. Watch Dogs Legion saw the Sapphire card matching the XFX Merc 310 at 102 frames per second, though the XFX does have slightly stronger 1% lows that could be argued as margin of error. Regardless, the Sapphire still pushes 4% ahead of the reference 7900 XTX, which is expected based on the extra cost you'd pay for a model like the Nitro Plus. So looking at a small selection of games, it's clear to see what Sapphire have done with the 7900 XTX and how it's actually paid off as it leads the pack, and in one game actually matched the RTX 4080 while also beating it in the 1% lows, which is pretty impressive. It also pushes far ahead of the reference 7900 XTX card from AMD, but you will be expected to pay a premium over that for the Nitro Plus. Gaming performance to one side though, the thing that I, and I'm sure most of you are interested in, is the cooling performance, of which we've had some strong numbers from a variety of cards already, so the Sapphire has some big boots to fill. What we saw here was during a run of F122 was the GPU temperature sitting at around 64 degrees, while the memory junction temperature hovered between 84 to 86 degrees. The all important hotspot temperature remained pretty consistent at 81 degrees, all while boosting to levels exceeding 2600 MHz. The total board power was just above 400 watts, all while the fans remained pretty silent around 1500 RPM. Now in terms of overclocking, if you've seen our other content on other models from various ARBs, you'll know that RDNA 3 is a bit of a weird one when it comes to overclocking, because instead of just finding the maximum speed, it's a bit more complex than that. And through our own findings, we increased the power limit by 15%, undervolted the voltage by about 50 millivolts, and then looked to increase both the max frequency ever so slightly, as well as the memory frequency, which is now sitting at 2700 megahertz. 
What this allows to happen is to keep temperatures in check while also giving a large boost range for the card to have a little more headroom. By pushing the card to these limits, this resulted in a GPU temperature of around 49 degrees and a memory junction temperature of 74 degrees. The hotspot temperature peaked at 73 degrees, but while this all sounds amazing, the fan speed did increase to beyond 3000 RPM. But, and it's a big but, as this isn't the first time we've experienced this, as we had similar issues with our XFX card and put it down to a dodgy driver or an issue with the card. But seeing the same behavior here, well, it does kind of point the finger a little more at AMD and something more underlying going on and not an actual issue with Sapphire cards or our particular sample. So to combat this, based on what Sapphire told us and our own findings, we kept our overclockings exactly the same, but we reduced our fan speed and locked it into place at 45% through the AMD settings. What this resulted in was a GPU temperature of 63 degrees and a memory junction temperature of 88 degrees, while the hotspot rose to around 84 degrees, which is significantly less than the 92 degrees on the power color card. This meant that our card managed to boost to a whopping 2,800 megahertz at points while the power sat at around 464 watts, so a little bit more than some of the other cards. And with our fixed fan profile, the fans remain extremely quiet at less than 1600 RPM, though we are told that the fans should remain a little under this even when overclocked and Sapphire are looking into it, but as I mentioned, I don't actually think it's a Sapphire issue. Now in games, this means we now see both the Sapphire and XFX cards battling things out quite fiercely, only separated by two FPS in the 1% lows, but still showing a percentage increase over its stock performance, which was already ahead of the reference card, now putting it 13% faster than AMD's own model. In Cyberpunk, the Sapphire card takes our top spot of the 7900 XTX cards with a just under 3% lead compared to its stock performance, and the overclock performance of the XFX Merc 310 card that we looked at recently. The only strange thing here is that the 1% lows dropped ever so slightly, but could be deemed as margin of error. In Death Stranding, the overclock gave us a small 3% boost over the stock performance, again now putting it as the king of the 7900 XTX cards, with a 3 FPS lead over the overclock performance of the XFX, also with stronger 1% low figures as well. What this also means is that the Sapphire card is now the fastest GPU we've had in this game, with the same average FPS as the NO3D RTX 4090, but with 11% better scores in the 1% lows. Lastly, in Watchdog Legion, we see a small uplift of just under 4%, which is similar to what we've seen on other cards, showing that this game just doesn't utilize overclock speeds quite as much as others, though free performance is still nothing to grumble at anyway. So I said at the start that this was the one I was looking forward to, and I think it's clear to see why. It's a beast, but it's also one of the best looking cards I've seen, not just from the RDNA 3 range, but as a whole across AMD and Nvidia based cards. I mentioned that if Apple were to make a 7900 XTX minus the RGB, I'm pretty sure this is what it would look like. It's clean, solidly built, and that makes it feel like it has kind of so much more added worth, which is important as Sapphire informed me that this card will be retailing for £1,179 in the UK, which by my calculations would put it around $1,100-ish in the US. Yes, that puts it closer to an FE4080, but custom AIB cards of that would then push that disparity just a little further anyway. Sure, it's more expensive than an MSRP like card like the AMD reference card and the Hellhound from Powercolor, and more towards kind of what's expected from the Merc 310 from XFX. And that's fine because they are both great cards for very different reasons. Performance wise, the Sapphire card does sit at the top and in one case actually beats the RTX 4090, at least in the 1% lows and matches it in the averages. But considering the price of that card, well, yeah, color me impressed. The other side of performance comes down to cooling and power. And yes, it's a bit of a power hungry card, but the wonderful trade off there is that the fans remain virtually silent. And I'd happily sort of use a bit more power and happily have that churning away next to me while I game. Couple that with a card that will look amazing in your system. And well, yeah, I think you're onto a winner. Now, I do have to address the issue with overclocking, and it's definitely something we'll be looking into as a whole, as it's not isolated to Sapphire, and talk of updating the driver could actually lead to a fix. So if you want us to look at that into maybe a little bit more detail, let me know in the comments section below. Either way, I know this was one card that was kind of heavily sought after, so hopefully this review has given you an idea as to what you get for your money, as I feel like you do actually get 
a lot. A great looking card, strong gaming performance, amazing cooler, overclocking headroom, and it's only a little more over MSRP. Admittedly, I've made it pretty clear that kind of, you know, $1,000 is a lot for a GPU, but I have no control over that. So it is what it is. So instead I'm looking more at the kind of, I guess the price uptake over MSRP. And for me, you get a lot for that extra kind of bit of money. What do you think? Is a Nitro Plus worth the extra cost? What do you think of the design? Do you agree with me? Let me know in the comments section below. For me, yeah, it's probably my favorite 7900 XTX so far, but we've only looked at four. So that could all change in the future, who knows? For now, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, then consider supporting us over on Patreon, where you'll get tons, and I mean tons of cool features, including a live Q&A session that's starting in January, exclusive behind the scenes content, and much, much more. The link for all that good stuff, again, is down below. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys.